We were living in a hostile country in a house that headquarters had told us was wired for surveillance. Our housekeeper was on the, the payroll of the government. <laughs> I was so young, you know, I was 22 years old. The only other job that I'd ever had was working in a bookstore. I ended up going to the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown and I started doing historical research on the data around terrorism. That was where the CIA officer in residence first found me. He was a declared officer and he taught a course on national security and intelligence. The very first step was a coffee on campus. Um, and then a first interview that, yes, was in a, a kind of nondescript chain hotel across the river in Virginia. And that was the beginning. After a lot of work at headquarters in many different divisions, you go into the full field tradecraft training. There have been movies and books written about it, um, but nothing can really prepare you for it. It's called The Farm. It's a huge, expansive space, an old base that has been redesigned to look like a foreign country. You know, it has a pretend embassy and a pretend town square, and you play the role of a first tour officer. It's like method acting. You know, 24 seven, you're living this fiction. Every pretend politician, pretend newscaster, pretend terrorist source, they're all former CIA officers who have come back to be uh, teachers. Slowly the operations and the threats begin to ramp up and get more and more intense until you really almost believe that it's real. We're immersed in this fiction knowing that any time we made a mistake, if we revealed the identity of a source, if we drove our car over a pretend explosive device without realizing, if we left notes in the cup holder and our car got searched by one of the fake road stops, we would lose our place at the farm and either leave the agency forever or be stuck doing some kind of paper pushing job back at headquarters for the rest of our career. Pressure was enormous. Suddenly, this siren goes off across the base and everyone just stops. The simulation is over. After I left the farm, it was a real challenge to come up with um, a narrative that, that fit who I was and explained why I was in those parts of the world. But there are many different covers that are used in order to get close to the sources that have information about impending attacks or terror groups' plans. One of the things I didn't realize was how lonely this work is because in the end you have to have one priority and it is your employer, your operation. I got married to a fellow officer in order to deploy together. Uh, we were told by our bosses that as part of the operation we could either go solo or we could get married and deploy together. I think one of the pieces of guidance that all young couples hear when they run into trouble is communicate communicate with one another. And for us, that was impossible. We were living in a hostile country in a house that headquarters had told us was wired for surveillance, audio and visual. Our housekeeper was on the, the payroll of the government. So every interaction, every comment we made to one another was being watched um, and assessed by, by a foreign hostile regime. While we were deployed overseas, had a daughter that I think ultimately made me much better at what I was doing, even communicating with people who I should on the face of it hate and fear. The first trip that I made to do operational work without my daughter once she was born was to talk with a group that had acted as a go-between in the past between us and a terror organization that was planning an attack. I remember walking into that room with my armor locked down so tight because it was a dangerous situation. There were two fighters off to the side with weapons. The leader that I was speaking to had a child. His baby was having trouble breathing. And I noticed that the whole time we were arguing over whether or not this attack would hurt civilians or not, the baby was struggling for breath. My own daughter also was having challenges breathing. We suddenly were engaging with one another in a different way. I had with me a clove oil bottle and had had a lot of success with clove oil in steam for my daughter and suggested this home remedy. And in that moment, we weren't fighters on opposite sides of the line. We were two parents on the same side of the line trying to keep our kids safe in the face of pollution. It was only a brief interaction, but when we returned to the subject at hand, 
there was a softness there that hadn't been there before. And it's hard to tell with any of these operations whether it was the thing you did that made any difference. Maybe the attack didn't happen for any number of other reasons, but in that case, it didn't happen. I often wonder whether I would do it all over again. It's not a career that you necessarily find a lot of personal happiness in, but there's enormous fulfillment. And I think that in many ways what we need are the people who won't find personal happiness doing this job to do it. If you grew up thinking it was cool uh, to, to be a spy, you know, I don't know, maybe it's actually not the work for you.